This is Brian Scudamore. He turned his $1,000 in savings into a $700 million company that collects garbage. What's even crazier is he almost flunked out of high school and built the company to help pay off his college debt. So I sat down with Brian, the founder of 1-800-GOT-JUNK, and this is his story. And on my last phone call with the producers, and they said, sorry, you know what? We just don't think that we can make this happen. We've never had a CEO on the show. And I said, can you imagine if this was the first one? I went out to a dozen franchise experts. They said, this business cannot be franchised. Are you kidding me? We built a $700 million business. I believe when people are telling you your idea is a bad one, you might be on the right track. Yeah, no, happy to be here, Seamus. I don't get to say this very often, but when I started my business, I was almost your age. I mean, <laughs> come on, you're 17 years old. How often does that happen that you're interviewing someone, you know, a successful entrepreneur and many, many successful entrepreneurs? So I'm humbled to be in your uh, company here as someone you're interviewing. And uh, it sort of takes me back. I'm like, you know, kids, you know, you're 17 years old. I was 18 when I started my business. And I think people underestimate youth but look what you're capable of and fantastic. So thanks for including me. I appreciate it. I wanna first start off with those in the audience who may not know your story. Junk, of all things, is something most people would not expect to be able to build a $700 million business out of. So how did you first come across junk, of all things? Well, ultimately I was looking to pay for college. Simple goal was just looking to fund my college education. And I was actually one course short of graduation. And I talked my way in to university. My parents were not going to fund my education because I didn't finish high school and didn't have the bare minimum. And so one day I was in a McDonald's drive through I was in the beat up old pickup truck in front of me and in, in line, plywood sides built up on the box. The truck was filled with junk. And I looked at that truck and I'm like, I need a way to pay for college. I've talked my way into college. That was my ticket. I went and bought a truck. I had $700, actually $1,000 was my life savings. I had $700 that I put towards a pickup truck, the rest towards flyers and business cards. And shortly thereafter, a week later, I had a business. We were called the Rubbish Boys. It was really just me, but I had a name and a vision for something bigger. And off I went, hauling away junk, funding my college education, and quickly realizing I was learning much more about business, running a business more than studying in school and made a tough decision to drop out with just a year left of my degree. And you were in college during that time. How did some of your friends feel about you starting a company about junk? Were they jealous or doubtful? Or what was that like? I, I don't know if they understood or saw as I didn't as well a vision to build something bigger at that moment. But I think they were envious that I was my own boss, that I was making good money. And, but you know, they looked at this business and thought, it's just junk removal. Brian chose not to go to college. That's his choice. I don't think that they really saw a future that I did, which was ultimately let's build an incredible brand with awesome people. And today to have a $700 million company across three countries, I feel proud, not of the size of the business necessarily, but, but the scope and the people we brought into building this incredible dream of business ownership, not just for myself, but for other entrepreneurs. We've created a franchise model, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Similar to McDonald's, you've got people who have skin in the game, that they've got ownership. And we've done that with all our businesses. We actually have three businesses, by the way. So not just 1-800-GOT-JUNK, the first baby in the family, but we got into the painting business. Wow, one day painting where we paint people's homes in a day. And then we've got Shack Shine, which is windows, gutters, power washing, and Christmas lights. We're in the house detailing business. So all three businesses afford us the opportunity to attract other entrepreneurs who don't have a recipe, a formula to follow, and they join forces with us and build some great businesses and great lives. The fascinating part is you were not only able to combine the junk business, but also two other very successful franchises, Wow One Day Painting and Shack Shine, and put them all under one roof. Yeah, it's interesting. They're not really combined, so to speak. It's it's like a family. I've got three kids as well. So let me look at myself and my wife as parents. We have three kids. You can't combine them. They're all different, different right. personalities, different interests, and so on. O2E Brands, which stands for Ordinary to Exceptional, is the parent company that I started, that we manage, that has three different businesses that are related in one sense. So like kids, they're related, they're home services. 
but they're very, very different, each and every one of them. What we stand for is exceptional service. So we find the right people. As my hat says today, it's all about people. That is one thing that I could impart to a, a Generation Z audience is find the right people, treat them right, the rest will follow. In every business we chase that we want to build, we know if we find the right people and take care of those people, they will take care of the customer. If we take care of the customer, they will take care of the growth of our profit, our opportunity, our revenue, and so on. So the idea to put them all together under one umbrella, so to speak, was really just, I wasn't completely satisfied with one business. I wanted more. And 22 years later, after starting 1-800-GOT-JUNK, I took on my second challenge of WOW One Day Painting. When you first came across experts in the franchise business, they told what you were doing was crazy, impossible in fact. How were you able to scale the three businesses and run them today with franchising? Well, you know, I know you're a little bit about you that you're in the VC world. So you're taking other people's money and investing and buying businesses and growing them. I'm doing the same thing, but my method of other people's money is we charge a franchise fee they come in like a McDonald's and they get the playbook, the proven recipe, the support of the team that says, we're behind you. You're in business for yourself, but not by yourself. And so franchising is a model that I love. It's interesting because I didn't understand franchising in the beginning to think that there was a bit of, that it had some glamour and sexiness to the industry until I met Shaquille O'Neal during the pandemic, Shaq spoke at our conference. And after our conference, he said, hey, I want to invest in one of your businesses. I love what you guys are doing. Let's chat. So we became buddies. We got to chat a little bit through some phone calls, Zoom, and, and having a lunch. And I remember what, what he said to me is he goes, listen, not everybody, because I asked him, why is he in franchising? He's like the franchise king. Why, Shaq, are you, have you built a half a billion dollars of wealth in franchising? He said, listen, I've taken everything from basketball, what I've learned about team building, playing the plays, following a, a playbook, putting the right people in the right seats and cheerleading us to, to winning. He said, you can do that in business and you buy a franchise. I don't need to be the guy creating the race car. I want to be the guy driving the race car. And it made me realize franchising is actually a pretty cool model. And it certainly worked for us. Your hat. It says it's all about people. And I think that couldn't be more correct. Businesses, they aren't corporations. They aren't big buildings. They aren't a stock price. They're a group of people, whether it's two, 10, or a 1,000 working together to provide value in some way, shape, or form. One of the hardships you had to go through in your business was firing 11 of your employees. Why? Yeah, so five years into the business, 1994 to be precise, gotcha. this hat, this model of it's all about people is a slogan that was born in my brain. It was born out of hardship. I had 11 people. They say one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. I think I had nine bad apples. Not that they were bad people, but they were the wrong fit for me. They didn't believe in customer experience. They didn't see this as an opportunity. They saw it as, as a negative. And I said, listen, this isn't just a job. I love what I'm doing and I need people on board that also see that same thing. So I sat down with my team of 11, didn't know who the two good ones were. So I just said, I'm gonna wipe out the entire team and start again. Now it was my failure to be clear, Seamus, this was not their problem. This was mine. I sat down with all 11 people and said two words. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I let you down. Didn't give you the love and support, the guidance you needed to be successful in this business. I might have picked the wrong people. We'll never know. But what I know is I don't know how to get people to the other side of creating this incredible business together. And I had to start from scratch. I had to bring new people in, people that saw the spark that I I could see, they could feel the energy of this is an incredible business. We are going to transform. We used to say we are going to build the FedEx of junk removal, clean, shiny trucks, friendly, uniform drivers, on-time service, upfront rates. To do that, I needed the right people. So I got these 11 out and it was painful trying to rebuild the business, going from five trucks down to one, trying to rebuild and hire people that understood what the vision was and what the possibility of this business was. And off we went, we rebuilt and, you know, today to have over 6,000 employees across the system, that would have never happened if we didn't figure out who are the right people. And then the leadership, which I had to learn and our team had to learn of how to treat those people right. Yeah. Layoffs are one of the unfortunate events we are seeing more frequently. Bill George, he came on the podcast a few months ago. 
He's the former CEO of Medtronic. And although Medtronic very rarely had layoffs, when they did, what he would do is set up job fairs and introduce some of those who were laid off to different companies and try to be a resource in however which way he could. How do you think leaders should handle layoffs or hardships in a business during difficult times? You've got to preserve the core, I think, that you know layoffs happen. I've been through them in my own world, my own life and business. They're unfortunate and you don't like to let people go, but make sure you keep the real, we call it the God forbid list. Who's on the God forbid you lose these people type of list? Who just can't you afford under any circumstance to lose? During COVID, we made that list and we said, listen, we're going to make sure we keep these people happy and do whatever it takes to, to get through this together. And so in a recessionary time, when this happens, you focus on who can't you afford to lose and the people you do lose, you, you allow them to keep their dignity. You help them get new opportunities. When we let some people go during COVID, we really tried hard to place them in other businesses that might have been hiring, using some of our relationships, giving them a soft landing. If you believe that it's all about people, you've got to remember that every person you let go is still a person with maybe a family, a heart, a vision. You've got to try and give them the best possible chance at their next go that you can. And when you know Elon Musk first acquired Twitter, one of the first actions he took was actually firing a large number of employees, including, unfortunately, the ones he could not afford to lose. And actually, just days later, he tried to rehire some of those employees back. So now that we've come up to this point, you've had the opportunity to appear on shows such as Oprah and Ellen. And on Ellen, I noticed by doing a little bit of background research before the show that you were the first CEO to join Ellen in over 19 years of the show being in existence. How did that come to fruition? So it was a part of our, there's a sign behind me. It says, it's kind of fun to do the impossible by Walt Disney, my favorite quote of all time. And what it does is it always plants this, if only you can believe. Walt Disney had to be the only person that believed in his vision to start planting that seed towards making it happen. I wrote down down one day in our painted picture, our vision for the future. I said, we will be on the Ellen DeGeneres show. I said in a separate painted picture earlier, we'd be on the Oprah Winfrey show. People thought both of them were nuts. And on the on the surface, they seem crazy. Why would this little tiny junk removal company get on the Oprah show? But what we did is we planted that idea and said, can you imagine if we actually made that happen? And we just worked it and worked it and talked our way into both shows. And Ellen took us years and years to make it happen. So difficult. To make it happen that on my last phone call with the producers, there were five of them on the, the call on a Zoom. And they said, sorry, you know what? We just don't think after talks that we can make this happen. We've never had a CEO on the show in our 19 year history. And I said, can you imagine if this was the first one? And I was the first, Airbnb was the second. You just have to believe in that possibility and give them a reason to want to help you win. So I've been on Oprah, I've been on Ellen, I've been on Seamus. Come on, man. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know when I first started the podcast, my close friends were like, I don't think this is ever going to work. I started it back in 2020. And to be honest, it was very hard. At points, I thought, am I ever going to actually get this off the ground? For the first three to four months, I only had eight listeners, but I kept with it because I had something to prove. And I've been able to meet incredible people like Mark Cuban, Spencer Raskoff, who's the former CEO of Zillow, Tim Draper, and Mercedes Bent, who's a partner at Lightspeed Ventures, along with many others. So as we wrap it up here, what would be your key takeaways for the Gen Z audience or aspiring entrepreneurs who might be listening? Sure. So one of my top takeaways, I'm going to tie back to you for a second. A 17-year-old, you got to use your age, and I'm sure you are to your advantage. It opens up doors. You reached out to me and you told me you were 17 and you wanted me to be on your podcast. And I'm like, when someone reaches out and tells you they're 17 and they want you in the podcast, I don't care if you have eight listeners. I'm saying yes. So how do you use your youth to be hungry and eager and want to learn and just make it happen? And I think that, you know, a Gen Z, younger than a a Gen Xer like myself, use that. You've got so much to learn and I've got so much to learn. I never stop learning. So every single moment of every day, I'm trying to meet people. I'm trying to learn from from others. I mean, when we 
hit stop on the, the record button here. I want to learn from you for a minute and find out how did you get Mark Cuban and all these great people to come on your show. It's an incredible story. And I hope to introduce you to someone that you might have on your wish list as well. So just stay hungry, dream the impossible, make big things happen. And, and one last thing I'm going to tie back to you. You said a minute ago, Seamus, you said everyone thought you were nuts, you know, that you couldn't do this show. I believe when people are telling you you're telling you your idea is a bad one, you might be on the right track. It's worked for me. I had franchise experts tell me. I went out to a dozen franchise experts. They said, this business cannot be franchised. Are you kidding me? We built a $700 million business out of, out of something that can't be done. It was only impossible until we made it possible. So thank you for having me on the show. And it's such a real honor. And I can't wait to uh, learn more about you after we hit uh, stop. Absolutely. I appreciate you taking the time to join the show. And for everyone interested in the audience down below, I'll have a link to Brian's book in the episode description. And thank you very much, Brian, for taking the time to join the show. Awesome. Thank you.